Dear Mr. Nordhoff, I cannot describe my mood when I learned of your departure. I'm not ashamed to say that I cried when the choir master read your letter to the choir. Es würde mir zu Gewissheit. Gottes Wille kennt kein Warum. I accepted it as fact. God's will knows no why. Ich wollte tapfer sein, das Unvermeidliche tragen und doch musste ich unterlegen. Nun sagen Sie mir bitte, aber es in Ihrem Interesse liegt. I wanted to be courageous, bearing the unavoidable, but I had to succumb. Now tell me please whether it is in your interest that we get to know each other more closely, to test each other. Dear Miss Laube, our correspondence has reached a point beyond which it can only be advantageously conducted if we are completely honest with ourselves and each other. And this condition forces me to decide whether I, for the first time in my life, should trust a person with things that I have heretofore kept for myself at the very depths of the shrine of my heart. Wir leben in einer schweren Zeit. Trug und Schein verhüllen die Wahrheit. Alle Menschen tragen irgendwelche in hard times. Swindles and shams cloak the truth. Everyone wears some kind of mask. Raw lust and cupidity show up everywhere. And it is a stroke of luck, a blessing, if one can remain straight and unbowed, if one does not succumb to temptation and can salvage one's faith and yearning for what is good, true and noble. Hi, I'm Shelley Klein. I'm the public historian at the Midwest Center for Holocaust Education. I received my PhD from the University of Kansas, and my area of research is uh, women in the Holocaust, specifically Nazi women guards in the concentration camp system. My interest in the Holocaust have always centered around the individual and the role of individuals in these larger events. So to me, it was really interesting and important to understand how it is that ordinary individuals come to be a part of, of something like the Holocaust. So that's how I come to this, um, this particular area of history. Today I'd like to talk to you about uh, Germany in the 1930s, specifically 38 to 40, but also just more generally um, beginning in 1933. So the fourth areas that we'll go through are uh, the racial state, marriage under the Third Reich, policy towards the Jews, and military conquests and war. So I think these are, are four areas that are really crucial to understanding this time period, um, specifically to understanding this time period and the play that you'll all be watching. So January 30th, 1933, this is the day that Hitler is appointed Chancellor of Germany. He has come to power legally. He's been appointed the Chancellor by President von Hindenburg. The Nazis had enough seats in Parliament that their leader could be chosen as the Chancellor. And so uh, it was decided that, that Hitler would be that leader. If you look at this picture, it's interesting because um, so often when we see Hitler, we, we see him in military. Um, attire and here he is very much the civilian the politician wearing his coat and tails and you know when you, you see this the dynamic between Hindenburg and, and Hitler here um, it's a very false one because in this picture it looks um, like Hitler's being very conciliatory uh, very much um, submissive to uh, Hindenburg the president of course uh, very quickly um, Hitler will become the sole power in, in Germany but very important to understand that he does come to power uh, legally. Very quickly after uh, the Nazis are in power, we see their ideology of a racial state be implemented. And this is the idea, the idea that there are individuals that are harmful to the racial health of the state. Ideas of racial health are something that are not necessarily unique to Nazi Germany. Um, racial health, this idea of eugenics, promoting the the strength, the racial strength of a people, um, that's ideology that comes from the 19th century, from social Darwinism, and it pervades a lot of Western countries. Of course, Germany is the one that will take this ideology the farthest, um, but it is something that was was happening in, in other places and is very much um, part of, of Western society. There's a quote here by, by Goebbels that I think really highlights what 
what this ideology was. And he says, our starting point is not the individual. We do not subscribe to the view that one should feed the hungry, give drink to the thirsty, or clothe the naked. Our objectives are entirely different. We must have a healthy people in order to prevail in the world. And that last statement is really key, a healthy people in order to prevail in the world. Nazi Germany is building a strong country, a strong people, so that they can be strong on the world stage. And if individuals are hurt um, in the way of that, um, they think that that's okay, because the, the real priority here is a strong state. The picture shows a doctor measuring the facial features of this young man, um, as it was believed that you could tell a lot about race and intelligence um, by the specific facial features and construction of one's body. Now, of course, we know this to be more pseudoscience, but at the time it was, it was certainly uh, believed. July 14th, 1933, we had the law for the prevention of hereditary diseased offspring. See how quickly this, this happens. Hitler um, becomes chancellor at the end of January. By July, we already see some of these, um, these laws go into place. This law will mandate the forced sterilization of certain individuals with physical and mental disabilities. Um, some of these disabilities listed here, we now know, of course, are, are not genetic. Some of them are, uh, but it was this idea that the wrong sort of people should not be reproducing. And of course, they would then want to later encourage the, the right sort of people to be, um, to be reproducing. The propaganda poster here just shows um, um, sort of that, that imagery too of, of what uh, the cost is to the state in terms of uh, when you have people who are, who are not strong, not strong bodied. Marriage in the Third Reich, um, that idea of racial purity will show up, of course, in marriage, who's, who's allowed to marry whom, and then who will then, of course, be reproducing. So people who wanted to get married had to produce uh, documentation of their Aryan lineage. Um, they had to show they were racially pure, um, ancestry as well, to determine who could be married. Germany wanted to encourage people to be married, encourage the reproduction of children, of course, if they were um, of the right racial sort. And so one of the ways they did this was by offering marriage loans. This was money that a couple could apply for that would help them pay for furniture and to set up their households. Uh, one of the stipulations of this loan, however, was that the bride stopped working immediately um, and that uh, she remain out of the workforce until the loan was, was actually paid off. If her husband made under a certain threshold of money, then, then she might be allowed to work. Um, later, some of these, these restrictions are relaxed a little bit as the demands of the war uh, keep them from realizing some of their ideology about women being back in the home. But initially, uh, things like the Marriage Loan Act work to remove women from the workforce, put them back in the home. A portion of the loan would also be forgiven for every child that a couple had. So a portion would be forgiven after one child, after two, after three, and I believe after four, um, the entirety of the loan would be forgiven by the state. So there was an economic incentive for couples to, to have children. 1935, uh, a law passed that mandates that it is the national duty for couples to have children if they're, if they're racially fit. Uh, and of course, this bans unions between the hereditary, uh, those who are hereditarily unhealthy. We'll come back to this in, in, the, in a little bit. The photos there show you what these certificates of uh, Aryan health certificates looked like. And then there on the bottom, we see a photo of Mein Kampf. This is a special wedding edition of Mein Kampf, something that was issued to all uh, married couples when they were married at City Hall. They were presented with this um, this copy of Mein Kampf, and it's, it's a special edition. Um, it always had this, it's actually dark blue leather there, you can't really tell in the picture, it looks black, but it's blue um, and white, and on the first page there'd be a seal of the, the city or the, um, the state, German state, that they were married in. There was a place for the couple to write their names, and sort of it's dedicated to them. Uh, and then there's a special inscription that says that, that the hope is that the ideas of the Fuhrer will guide their their marriage and their wedded tomorrows. What's really interesting about this is it's such a a very concrete example of how the state was becoming more involved in the personal lives of its citizens. So here, this very most basic building block of society and, and marriage at the very base of a family 
um, the state has inserted itself and they're saying here um, here are the ideas of the Fuhrer. You build your family, we build the state off of, of those things. So just noticing the ways that the, the state is creeping into um, the everyday lives of, of its citizens. As shown in their attitude towards marriage, specifically the uh, Marriage Loan Act, we see there is a, a definitely a traditional view of women um, that was perpetuated in Nazi Germany. There was an active removal of women from work and politics. Uh, to be female was not to be political. Uh, to be male was to be political. And so uh, to be a Nazi was to be political and women were supposed to be in the home. Um, under, the Weimar Germ under the Weimar government, which preceded um, the Nazi one, we saw a lot of, there were lots of advances made for women. Um, the right to vote, increased education, um, the German, the Nazi German government took a lot of that away. Um, and again, this push to return women to their traditional values and roles with children and the kitchen and church, all those things that we typically associate with traditional values for women. Uh, the, the Nazi government pushed those. Laws were later passed that removed or limited uh, the amount of women that could go to college and university. Additionally, those who were allowed to go, it limited the majors that they could undertake. So taking them out of things like math and science, um, relegating them to subjects such as um, home economics, things like that that were thought to be more womanly um, and also more useful to what their eventual role would be. We see the biological importance of women is, is emphasized. Um, miscarriages were investigated because again, if you were the right type of person, according to the state, uh, to be reproducing, then if you had some sort of, if you had a miscarriage, that was that was the state's concern because that was a child that um, should have been there for the state and, and what happened to make sure there was no foul play. Um, and then of course, women who were not supposed to be reproducing because of their racial conditions, um, sterilization um, happened to a number of them. Hitler will say that in my state, the mother is the most important citizen. So again, thinking about women only in terms of motherhood as the mothers of Germany, uh, the future of Germany, but, but only in that very strict biological role. The image here, you see um, the young girl who's a member of the um, BDM, or the basically the, the girl's version of the Hitler Youth, um, and then a Hitler Youth boy there. It's an interesting image because it, it really shows this um, these traditional values that they're they're pushing on on both here she he's bringing his uniform to her he's probably torn it or needs it fixed um, and she's gonna gonna sew it so that the women are learning the young girls are learning the, the mending and the sewing um, he's there preparing um, preparing as a young soldier uh, we can see these traditional images of women show up in propaganda as well um, and women are always shown as as mothers as the center of, of families this one you can see this lady has four kids um, but that is the that is the the correct place for women it's, it's all about marriage and and childbearing the jews were seen as a number of different threats within germany uh, they were seen as an economic threat for their supposed control on banking and money. They were seen as a political threat uh, for their supposed association with communism. And they were seen as a biological and social threat because of their hybrid mixed blood. Um, again, this is really important to note that in, in Nazi Germany, Jews were seen as a race. Uh, Judaism was not viewed as a religion. It was viewed as a race. So this is an important distinction from earlier times a persecution because in earlier time periods uh, it was seen that you know Jews could convert to Christianity and that would alleviate the, the persecution. In Nazi Germany uh, Judaism was seen as a race and again this goes back to some 19th century ideology as well um, but here here in, in Germany it's, it's, it's perpetuated. The poster um, on the left you can see it's a eugenics poster that shows the makeup, the racial makeup, supposed racial makeup of Jews, showing that it's a mixture of lots of different races, so it's less pure, of course, than the Aryans. Um, that is important, so this is a, why it's a biological issue, um, because there is a, a lack of blood purity, and of course why that matters to Germans is because these uh, less pure people are trying to um, mix their blood with that of German blood. So you see this idea of race defilement happening. So all these images here 
um, of these Jewish men show different ways that the, the Jews are dangerous. Um, the one with the two kids, that comes from a, a book called The Poisonous Mushroom, which is a children's book. This is a really interesting um, particular story. There's several stories within The Poisonous Mushroom. Some of them, uh, they all highlight the, the danger of Jews in various ways. The title story, The Poisonous Mushroom, is to show that even though Jews maybe look like everyone else, that they are actually, and live amongst us, they're, they're actually very dangerous. Just like there are poisonous mushrooms in the woods and there are okay mushrooms in the woods, some of them will kill you and some of them are fine. So it's trying to teach kids to, to be wary of the Jewish population among them. This particular story that I've highlighted here uh, with the, the man and the two kids, this one is interesting because it, it gives us both an anti-Semitic message, but also a gendered one. So you see these two kids are approaching this Jewish man who's giving them candy. This is a classic stranger danger um, scenario. If you read the text of the story, the little girl is intrigued by the candy. She, she wants some. It's the little boy, however, who sees the candy but then also looks at the man and thinks like, ah, I think we should, I think this man is Jewish. We should, you know, don't take candy from him. This is dangerous for us. So it's a little boy who understands the danger. So the message here is one, the Jews are out to get you. But two, um, it's a message to little boys that girls, women can be fooled. It's your job as the, the boy, as the man, as the future head of household, it's your job to um, to protect them, you know best. So there's there's that gendered message in there as well. You can see the um, the middle image of the uh, it's a doctor and a, a young girl. Um, that is the story of I think Inga and the doctor. Um, this is a story of a, a a young German girl who is told by her mother that she has to go to the doctor. She objects to going to the Jewish family doctor that they've always seen. She tells her mother that, no, we learned in, in BDM, we learned that my youth group leader, she told us that the Jews are dangerous and we should avoid them. Um, her mother says, we've always gone to this doctor, you're going to go. And so she goes to the doctor and she hears screaming from inside and the door opens a crack and this is the image that she sees. So again, the message here is twofold. One, the, the Jews are dangerous, they're, they're out to get you, they will do terrible things to you. They're dangerous, they're dangerous to the future of... Um, the German race because they're, they will defile you, but then also that your parents don't know best. It was your youth group leader, it was the BDM woman, the representative of the state, the Nazi state. That's the person who had your best interest at heart. They really knew. Your own mother um, was fooled. And so again, notice how um, the state is really inserting itself to this sort of most basic level um, into the family there. And the last image too, just again, a repeat of that idea that the, the Jews are, are out to get um, these non-Jewish women. Notice too, the, uh, the way these Jewish men are depicted, um, large, grotesque, animalistic features, typical, uh, stereotypical depictions of Jewish men. Also notice that they're all large. This idea of large, fat um, men was, it's getting at this idea that they, they, they're lazy that they got rich off the real labor, labor of others. Uh, again, this is a very German commentary on work, um, what constitutes real work and labor. And the professions that the Jews were in were often not seen as constituting real work. So there's some, some layered imagery happening there. This propaganda assault happened throughout the early 30s and almost immediately after Hitler comes to power, there are some, uh, some laws passed against Jews. There are um, diet laws passed that prohibit the kosher slaughter of animals, um, boycotts that happen. So there's there's a variety of restrictions that happen um, on Jews between 1933 and 34. However, it's in September of 1935 that the um, the biggest laws come into to effect here. The Nuremberg laws are constitutional changes um, that that impact the Jewish population. The first one is the Reich's flag law. This will make the party colors, red, white, and black, um, the national ones. And it makes the swastika, the Nazi party flag, the national flag. So you see the, the conflation of the party here now with the nation. Then we have the Reich citizenship law. This is where uh, German Jews lose their German citizenship. 
German Jews are classified instead as state subjects, and non-Germans, uh, non-German non-Jews, um, are classified as Reich citizens. So this is where this is the beginning of the stripping of civil rights um, that happened to German Jews. And you can see here, this is a picture of the Baltimore Sun, front page Baltimore Sun, that says Hitler deprives Jews of citizenship rights. Um, so just to note that this is something that the world saw. Um, this is a modern Western country, so of course the fact that they're stripping a section of their population of their citizenship would, would make the news throughout the world. Lastly, we have the law for the protection of German blood and honor. This means that German Jews are forbidden to marry or have sexual relations with uh, German non-Jews, and non-Jewish women cannot be employed in the homes of Jewish families, or men, um, if they are under the age of 1940, if they are under the age of 45. Why 45? This of course goes all the way back to childbearing and the ability, uh, are these women of the age that they can still have kids? And that then would constitute an interest of the state. If they are older than 45, um, the assumption is they're probably not able to still have children, um, so it doesn't matter. Um, but under 45, they want to make sure that that German blood and honor is protected. Lastly, uh, Jews are prohibited from flying the German flag, as that would be seen as an offense against German honor. In the picture, we see uh, this, they would have termed these people uh, inter an interracial couple. The woman's sign says, I'm the greatest swine, I only sleep with Jews. And his sign says, as a Jew, I only take German girls to my room. Notice how public this is, this public humiliation that these two people are undergoing. This had the effect of, sh again, showing people what was acceptable, and here, of course, what is not acceptable. After some of these were done, people sometimes took it on themselves to uh, make the point to their, their fellow citizens, uh, and so there were sometimes more informal actions taken against people who were seen as as breaking what is now the law of Germany. March 13th, 1938 was the Anschluss. This is the first expansion of German territory. Uh, this is when Germany joins Austria. Um, the Anschluss, it means union. So all the policies that Germany had against its own Jewish population now then apply to, to Austria. This uh, this annexation did have a lot of support from most of the Austrian um, population. And very quickly after the annexation, you do see a lot of anti-Semitic action and violence that follows. September 29th, 1938 is the Munich Agreement. Um, this is when the powers of the world, not including the US, um, agreed to give Germany the small area of Czechoslovakia known as the Sudetenland. Uh, Germany said he wanted, <clears throat> Germany said they wanted to unite German-speaking peoples. There were Germans in this area that were being mistreated that needed to be joined with Germany. Um, and so the powers of the world, in a attempt to avoid war, gave away a section of Czechoslovakia um, in an attempt to keep the peace, an attempt to avoid war. Um, this was the, you know, the people in this, this territory it was not like the uh, Anschluss, wasn't like the Union with Austria. You can see these women in the photo. Um, this was much more of an invasion and was not widely supported. Neville Chamberlain, who was the Prime Minister of Britain at the time, he returned from Munich and he, he held up a paper with Hitler's signature on it and he said, I have Hitler's signature. Um, I have secured peace in our time. Peace in their time lasted less than a year. November 9th and 10th, 1938, this is Kristallnacht. This is a violent pogrom that occurs throughout Germany, Austria, Sudetenland region. All the territory that is controlled uh, by Germany, this, uh, this violent pogrom happens. It's made to look spontaneous, but of course it is coordinated by the state. It takes its name from the, all the broken glass that was smashed um, throughout the night and Jewish businesses that were um, burned and looted, destroyed. Synagogues and homes uh, were also burned and destroyed. Again, synagogues throughout the 
throughout the German territory. Kristallnacht is a, a, a turning point for Jews in Germany because it's at this point that there's been all this legal stuff that's been happening before, but it's at Kristallnacht that things become violent. And it's at this moment that a lot of people realize that life in Germany, um, Jewish life in Germany is no longer possible. And it's at this moment that a lot, um, a lot of Jewish families try to turn towards immigration because, uh, because of the violence that's been unleashed. About 20 to 30,000 Jewish men were rounded up, sent to concentration camps. This is the first time that Jewish men are sent to concentration camps just for being Jewish. The camps have been open since 1933, but they mainly hold political dissonance and other um, political en enemies. They, they aren't for Jews. Kristallnacht is the first time um, that they're rounded up and taken for being Jewish. The point of this uh, was to push immigration, to scare families, and many of these men are released when their families promise that they can and will pay uh, to leave the country. About 100 Jews are killed over the course of this night. Uh, and also communal records are seized by the Gestapo. This was a way for the state officials to better understand who was Jewish. Uh, you have to register your religion with Germany, um, but there were many people who no longer identified as Jewish or perhaps their family had converted um, some generations before, but these communal records would, would have a better sense of who they would deem as Jewish because, again, it's looked at as a racial thing. This is also the first and only time that German Jews, that their property is destroyed without the people themselves being taken. And there's a very modern bureaucratic reason for this. These are a well-insured middle-class people. And so when their businesses were destroyed, when their homes were burned, they filed insurance claims. And those insurance companies were flooded with insurance claims so much so that they couldn't pay them out. And so they go to the government and say, you know, what happened here? We can't, we can't possibly pay these out. Um, and so the government learns that even though it was an impressive show um, of force and it was terrorizing, at the end of the day, it was just too expensive to ever be replicated. Quickly following Kristallnacht, we have a meeting on the Jewish question. Um, at this meeting, basically there were three goals, how to get Jews out of the German economy, how to segregate them from non-Jews, and how to force Jews out of Germany. At this point, um, the goal is to force immigration. I should also mention that the Jewish population of Germany is, is tiny. In 1933, there were about 600,000 Jews living in Germany. By 1939, there's about 300,000. So um, that number dramatically decreases over, over that six year period. Now we're talking, you know, there's a few, uh, a few more in Austria, some more in the Sudetenland, but by and large, we're talking about a pretty small number of people. So when they want to force Jews out of Germany and German held territories, this is to them a reasonable goal because they're talking about less than 600,000 people by this point. In 1938, there is no plan to kill Europe's Jews. There was only a plan to remove them from these territories. So removal is, is the policy as of 1938. Once Germany will move into those Eastern territories, Poland, the Soviet Union, once that happens, um, the Jewish population that they're dealing with skyrockets into the millions. And at that point, of course, um, immigration is no longer a viable option. But here in the 30s, when they're only talking about a small population, less than 600,000, um, that's something that they, they saw as reasonable. So, um, we see here following this meeting, a radicalization of legal assault against German Jews. They will lose their jobs. They can't pr practice many professions. They have to turn over their businesses, vacate their homes, lose their driver's license. Uh, they can't have pets. So a lot of civil rights are, are stripped from them during this period. Again, making it harder for them to be um, part of German society, just making it uh, difficult to live there with the end goal of forcing, forcing immigration. March 15th, 1939, um, this is when Germany will take over the rest of Czechoslovakia um, and occupy these additional territories. This is an interesting image too, because these are not Germans, these are Slovak collaborators. And whenever we see pictures like this, I think it's really important to think about who took them and why. Um, we see these young men are tormenting this Jewish man, they're burning and cutting his beard. But look at the expressions on their faces. 
it's really interesting to note here they think it's not only okay to do it but it's okay to take a picture this is something they want to remember uh, to share with others and i think that's uh um it definitely brings home the point about who um, the attitudes that people had uh and also just to to reiterate that it isn't just a german um isn't just germany that this is this is there's local collaboration as well So as of August 1939, on the eve of war, you can see what the German-held territories look like. Um, Austria, all of Czechoslovakia, um, there. September 1st, 1939, the war begins. Germany will invade from the west. The Soviet Union comes in from the east and they partition Poland. There's a time period where there, there isn't much military action, but in April of 1940, uh, that will quickly resume. So we have the invasion, occupation of Norway. Uh, Norway, Norway was needed for its naval bases to secure iron shipments from Sweden. And this will begin a series of fast military victories over the Western allies. A day later, April 9th, we had the invasion and occupation of Denmark. Uh, this was a very quick one, lasted less than six hours. They claimed it was pre to prevent a British, Franco-British attack. Um, and many say that the quick surrender led to lenient occupation terms. A month later, we had the invasion of the Netherlands the Dutch will surrender after the bombing of Rotterdam. Um, and the Netherlands did see one of the highest levels of collaboration during the Holocaust of any occupied country and of Western countries. It had the, um, it had the highest number, highest percentage of their Jewish population killed. May 27th, invasion of Belgium. This battle um, lasted 18 days. So again, a very pretty quick campaign. You can see one country after another falling. In June, we have the uh, invasion and occupation of France that lasts six weeks, uh, results in parts of France being placed under German occupation. And then finally, we have the Battle of Dunkirk uh, in June of 1940, where all of the remaining British and French forces were sort of pinned on the beaches of Dunkirk between the German army and the sea uh, until they could be rescued by um, commercial ships, military ships, private fishing boats um, that came across the English Channel and evacuated um, over 300,000 men from those beaches. But you can see that over this, basically from April to June, um, a fast series of these military battles that shows this expanding military project. With that, with the needs of the war, we see the, an increasing involvement of the state in, in personal lives. Um, that's been there from the beginning, right? We talked about um, the racial aspects that happen, how they're involved in marriage, and then now the war will, of course, um, make, that, make that even more so and will require a lot of its citizens. You'll see increased conscription, certainly for men, and by the end of it, um, for women as well, for different types of wartime work. So um, because of the war, all of citizens will be brought into some sort of, um, some sort of service.